Hello from the Fair Housing Department at Westchester Residential Opportunities. We've prepared this video with grant support from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development and from the Enterprise Community Partners as part of a project we're undertaking to investigate patterns of segregation where we operate in Westchester County and the Lower Hudson Valley of New York. Like many suburban communities in the northeastern United States, this region remains stubbornly segregated by race and ethnicity even 50 plus years after the passage of the Fair Housing Act. And in order to understand better these local patterns of segregation, we're looking in this video at some of the forces that drove residential racial segregation throughout the United States in the 20th century. We will not go back to trace the history of slavery in the United States or European colonization of the New World, which is not in any way to diminish their impact on the demographics of our country today. What we are going to look at is several key themes from the last 125 years, starting after the Reconstruction, particularly themes relating to the residential housing market. Obviously, by focusing on these inputs, we'll be missing or glossing over lots of other important contributing factors, and we will be oversimplifying very complicated matters. So apologies in advance for that. In particular, we will address three key systemic contributors to modern residential segregation. First, the institutionalized racism embedded in the Jim Crow laws and the explicit legal authority provided at the highest levels of the government for segregationist policies. Second, we'll look at the role of the professional real estate industry in nurturing segregation. And then finally, we'll look at the role of federal and local housing policies in promoting segregation. Jim Crow laws were reconstruction era laws, principally in Southern local jurisdictions, that codified racial segregation in public places like schools and other laws designed to disenfranchise African Americans like voter suppression laws, such as poll taxes, literacy tests, elaborate registration requirements, etc. Many of these laws continued in effect until the federal civil rights laws of the mid-1960s. Hand in hand with Jim Crow laws were extra legal forms of apartheid in the post-reconstruction period, Brutal white supremacist organizations like the KKK formed during the Reconstruction period as enforcers and enablers of these policies and social norms through blocking reforms and intimidating African Americans. Here, they demonstrate for all ladies of the KKK the dangers of standing downwind of a burning cross. I referenced earlier the important case of Homer Plessy versus Ferguson. Plessy was a deliberate test case by citizens looking to challenge Jim Crow laws. Plessy was a black man who bought a first-class ticket on a train from New Orleans and then tried to sit in the segregated all-white first-class cabin. Now, you might ask why they sold him that ticket in the first place. and Well, that's because he's white. Homer Plessy was only an eighth black. He had to actually tell the train conductor that he was an eighth black in order to force the issue and get himself arrested. Plessy's case made it up to the Supreme Court and was decided in 1896. The core holding of Plessy, separate but equal, became the law of the land, providing the support of the highest court for the constitutionality of explicitly segregationist laws. It's important to note that this court was not a Southern former Confederate court. Six of the seven justices in the majority were from states that sided with the Union. The sole dissenter in this 7-1 to one decision was Justice John Marshall Harlan, the court's great dissenter. He argued that any separation is inherently unequal, creating a publicly condoned caste system. And in fact, as this cartoon from 1904 demonstrates, the facts out there strongly supported his position, since so-called colored facilities were almost uniformly inferior to whites-only facilities. The modern real estate industry grew up in the early 20th century alongside racial segregationist policies and made residential segregation a central written tenet of its code for real estate agents. In 1917, in the Buchanan case, the Supreme Court held that city codes explicitly requiring residential segregation were unconstitutional, but the real estate industry quickly implemented a workaround which was the use of racially restrictive covenants built into property deeds and homeowners associations. Here you can see the text from Innis Arden Subdivision outside of Seattle, which was adopted in 1941. It's hard to read, but in the middle under the heading racial restrictions, you'll see it prohibits the ownership or occupancy of any unit by anyone not of the white or Caucasian race other than domestic servants. 
Closer to home, a survey of 300 residential developments built between 1935 and 1947 in Queens, Nassau, and Westchester counties of New York found that 56% had racially restrictive covenants. As is often the case with a revolving door government, in the early 1900s, the mindset of the government community development and housing authorities was largely identical to the private real estate industry. And so the federal government actively supported housing segregation. In particular, most federally funded housing was explicitly segregated. That sort of explicit segregationist policy leaves a lasting impact. However, perhaps the most impactful instance of government policies enforcing segregation and economic oppression of minorities was just a touch more subtle with the institutionalized redlining of black communities. In 1933, as part of New Deal efforts to rebuild after the Great Depression, FDR created the Homeowners Loan Corporation, which commissioned a rating system that color-coded neighborhoods based on desirability for mortgage lending, with the red or hazardous areas being the least desirable and accordingly receiving the least financial support. And yes, areas with higher minority populations were systemically painted red. Those redlining maps told banks and insurance companies across the country which communities to invest in and which to avoid, promoting disinvestment in communities of color. These policies have had a significant long-term impact, perpetuating economic disenfranchisement of minority communities. A study by the National Community Reinvestment Coalition, released in 2018, found that 74% of neighborhoods that were graded as red are low to moderate income neighborhoods today, and 64% are majority minority neighborhoods today. In contrast, the neighborhoods that were graded green, or the most desirable back in the 30s, are now 91% upper income and almost entirely white. The Federal Housing Administration was formed in 1934 to provide a safer and more robust home financing system. FHA had a standardized set of underwriting rules and provided federal mortgage insurance for participating loans to protect the banks from defaults. Between 1930 and 1960, with the federal government providing favorable lending terms, at least to white homeowners, home ownership in America went from 30% of households to over 60%, but not much of that benefit accrued to non-whites. Between 1930 and 1950, FHA financed 60% of home purchases in the United States, but less than 2% of FHA loans were made to non-white households. Restrictive covenants were struck a blow in 1948 when the Supreme Court in Shelley v. Kramer ruled that state actors like the courts couldn't enforce racially restrictive covenants. However, the court did not go so far as to say that the covenants were invalid as between the contracting parties, so their use continued, although with less ability to enforce them judicially. As restrictive covenants were becoming a more maligned and less effective tool, municipalities turned to zoning laws to help enforce the status quo for their homeowners. Because these zoning rules were facially neutral, it was much harder for anyone to prove they were discriminatory in intent, even when the effect was to exclude certain minority populations. Now we come to Brown v. Board of Education, the 1954 Supreme Court ruling that struck a key legal blow against segregation in the U.S. schools. The Supreme Court declared emphatically that separate is inherently unequal and segregation harms black Americans. Interestingly, in the lead case, the black school facilities in Topeka, Kansas, which were the subject of the lawsuit, weren't particularly unequal to the related white schools. They had been found to be comparable. But the court said that doesn't matter. The court found that segregated schools are inherently unequal. One side note, in, this, in its decision, the court takes account of research submitted by the educational psychologist Kenneth B. Clark and Mamie Phipps Clark, who were the first and second black PhDs from the Columbia School of Psychology and lived in the Westchester village of Hastings-on-Hudson. The Clark's doll test studies, which are depicted in this picture here, demonstrated how segregation adversely affects black school children's psychological status. Further side note, Dr. Kenneth Clark was the first chair of the board of directors of WRO when we were founded in 1968. The Fair Housing Act was enacted in April of 1968 in the wake of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and the racial justice riots across the U.S. that followed. The Fair Housing Act made racial discrimination in housing illegal, but it couldn't change the legacy of a century of segregationist policies. 
Segregated communities like ours in Westchester County and the surrounding counties were created over decades of concerted government and community practices, and those effects are stubborn and long-lasting. You may well ask yourself, why does it matter so much where someone lives? Well, just like any real estate agent knows the secret is location, 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 most of us know intuitively that where you live matters. The reality is that the community you live in offers you a complex and intertwining opportunity set. Consider, for example, the housing stock. Is the housing in your community safe and up to code, or is it substandard or overcrowded? Do homes in your community appreciate in value over time, or education? How are the public schools in your district and the surrounding districts? They aren't all equal. Are the good schools in the wealthy white communities and the troubled schools in lower income communities of color? Or public safety, crime rates, and the relationship of the community to the police and emergency services professionals matter? Or employment, access to jobs and good jobs? Economics, broadly speaking, means financial well-being, which includes wealth, income, and the prospect for intergenerational wealth building and transfer, which for most families comes through home ownership. Health is a multifaceted element in itself. It includes healthcare access, nutrition, and open spaces. Which communities have the trees, the parks, the farmers' markets, and which are located near landfills or other environmental contaminants or in food deserts? And access to credit and banking, and this is a key contributor to economic opportunity. Communities of color rely much more heavily than white communities on non-traditional credit, like expensive payday loans. And last, transportation. Is the community cut off or located on key commuter lines to the job centers? All of this is to say that segregation isn't some harmless byproduct of racism, nor an innocuous matter of housing choice. It is a system deliberately designed to diminish opportunity for a subset of the population based on nothing but the color of their skin or where they or their family were born. So how do we fix this? Well, there's no simple solution to the racial segregation we're experiencing here in the county and beyond. No one can just press a button and change this. Solving these deep inequities will require a long and persistent struggle with lots of money and effort from the public and private sectors. If anything, this presentation is meant to convey the depth of the problem we're trying to counteract. 100 plus years of segregation of policies embraced by the private sector and the federal, state, and local government. One key tool that we have is affordable housing. While applied on a non-discriminatory basis, access to affordable housing, particularly in high opportunity areas, supports anti-discrimination and the unraveling of segregation. Another tool is housing counseling services. Organizations like WRO provide a broad range of housing services to generally low-income households. Year over year in our region, those clients are predominantly people of color, and we're helping them stay in their rental housing or avoid mortgage foreclosure or get the funding they need to buy a first home. And one more key tool is fair housing laws. WRO and other groups provide education on and enforcement of the federal, state, and local housing anti-discrimination laws. Thank you for watching our video. If you're aware of housing discrimination, please contact us to report it. Maybe we can help. The easiest way to reach us is by email. We have a staff directory on our website. You can see the address here on the screen email anyone in the Fair Housing Department. And while you're visiting that website, please take a moment to support WRO by clicking the donate button. Housing is always essential. And we're here to help. Like, subscribe, and share this video, and please follow us on social media. Thank you.